Hello everybody, Julian Charles here of themindrenewed.com, coming to you as usual from the depths of the Lancashire countryside here in the UK. It's my pleasure to welcome back to the programme Tom Secker, who joined us early last year to talk about his book on the 2005 London bombings, Secrets, Spies and 7-7. Tom is a UK-based writer, researcher, filmmaker, podcaster, producing the excellent Clandestine podcast and the podcast series Disinfo Wars over at Sybil Edmonds Boiling Frogs Post.com. He specialises in the study of terrorism, the security services, declassified history, the philosophy and politics of fear, and particularly how all of that relates to the film industry. Tom is, as he says on his website, a proud northerner, and as he says in one of his podcasts, prejudiced against pretty much everybody who doesn't come from Yorkshire. So, Tom, thank you very much for condescending to speak to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's a pleasure, Julian. I mean, I think you perhaps don't need to take that statement too seriously. <laughs> I didn't take it too seriously, but I thought it worth mentioning somehow. <laughs> <laughs> well, always joking aside, I have actually very much appreciated your podcast, Clandestine, and uh, especially your more recent criticisms of the truth movement, which uh, people may be surprised to hear me say that. I don't know. Um, but I think you've been rightly criticising some of the carelessness and sensationalism that uh, does often characterise the alt media. Not always, but often. And uh, I do agree with you. And having been on the receiving end more recently of some rather strange requests to cover subjects that I frankly don't think are worth pursuing at all. I won't say what those subjects are, but I think people can probably guess what they are. Um, I found what you said in those shows quite helpful. So uh, thanks ever so much for doing them. But as a matter of interest, what kinds of specific concerns have prompted you to do that kind of thing in more recent months? Well, I guess, I mean, these are concerns I've had in one way or another for a long time. Going back to even before I started a blog in maybe 2008, um, I always had reservations about the truth movement, even the name, the truth movement, yeah. um, and the claim implicit in that, and the whole kind of philosophy around it of, like, we are the guardians of the truth, and we are thus, yeah. in some way, on an important mission to, whatever it is, get the information out there, wake people up, any one of these kinds of slogans that people use, they're essentially what they're saying with that is, I don't really know what I'm doing here. It's an admission when you use a cliche like that, that you don't actually have a more overriding purpose. You're putting it all on someone else. Rather than saying, I have a responsibility here towards my own life and to the lives of the people around me, my friends, family, whoever that is actually close enough to me to influence and help. Right. It's, no, 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 no. Yeah. My responsibility is towards making everyone else in the world believe what I believe. I always had a problem with that dimension to it. And, okay, in some cases, I think that was a valuable and important endeavor to try and use internet media and other fringe forms of media to try and, I don't know, increase public awareness of certain information, certain facts, certain events, whatever. I don't have a problem with that per se. My problem is with, <laughs> I guess, there's always been a whole bunch of topics that have been lumped in with very serious things like 9-11 and 7-7 that are treated as though they're the exact same thing. As though if you believe that the official story of 9-11 isn't true, you must therefore also believe, just to take a ridiculous example, that the moon is hollow and that there are aliens inside it who are spying on us and trying to control world events. Mm -hmm. I mean, those two things don't equate. Those two things aren't in the same ballpark. Mm. Not that I actually know whether the moon is hollow. How would I? But, um, <laughs> well, well, well that's, that's a separate question, of course, yes. But, of course, of course. I, I would agree but with that's you. My it's point. unreasonable it is to a, think that that is, is true, but uh, <laughs> it is a separate question, certainly. Um, but that's the whole point, that if you mix in the one with the other, mm. then what right do you have to call yourself a truth movement? And what right do you have to be claiming that I'm getting important information out there that's really going to change things? Because <laughs> you're just sort of muddying the waters well, for everybody, I think. And that was always yeah. an issue I had. And, okay... Most of that is relatively benign and kind of nutty, crazy stuff. But what I've seen in the last two, three years in particular, basically you had the 10-year anniversary of 9-11, and after that the 9-11 truth movement fell apart and has become, no disrespect, but has become essentially irrelevant. It doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Plenty of people out there still care. Plenty of people out there still trying to do something. But as a movement, it has collapsed. And I don't think 
we should be in denial about that. You would go so far as to say it's actually collapsed. And I was speaking to Richard Gage a few weeks ago, and he wouldn't agree with you, but then I suppose he's, he's still soldiering on. But uh, I'm not sure that I agree that it's collapsed. Are you overstating that? I mean in the sense that when you compare it to what it was five years ago, or ten years ago even, it peaked somewhere between, I would say, 2006 and 2009-ish. It then declined a bit. And like I say, I think it was in the wake of the 10th anniversary, a lot of people felt, well, here we are 10 years later, and are we banging our heads against a wall? Even if we think we're onto something, and even if we think this still matters, are there not more pressing things, such as the economic problems? And so attention, I think, has diverted to other things. Maybe collapsed is an exaggeration, maybe you're right in that, but what I mean is that overriding sense of purpose that the 9-11 truth movement had and that that inspired in other, you know, the wider truth movement, that has gone. And now the truth movement doesn't really know what it's there for. So it starts pursuing all kinds of extremely dubious things. And there's a one-upmanship with it as well, isn't there? That if you're the yeah. person who's really cutting edge, you'll be looking at the really strange things that everybody else is, well, they're not quite up to snuff somehow. Oh, there's certainly that kind of, uh, yeah, yeah, one-upmanship. Uh, I'm more conspiracy theorist than you. Mm. I don't even believe anyone died at Sandy Hook. Yeah. Not just yeah. this could have been a black operation or that the media lied about it or that there's been a huge cover-up. But I don't even believe those people ever even existed. So, yeah, top that. Yes, um, yes it is a most unfortunate thing, I agree. Nothing that you've believed up until this point is good enough. It's all got to be thrown out of the window and replaced with something else. And I'm just thinking, what? So we're not even allowed to think we're human beings living on a planet that's rotating around a sun? We're not even allowed to believe, for example, that murder is wrong? Because I'm pretty sure it is. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Um, I don't think these are apple carts that need to be overturned, <laughs> is, is what I'm saying. And yet the truth movement seems to now, lacking that unified sense of purpose, the big things. And I, I imagine a similar thing happened in the wake of the JFK uh, assassination, that for a while that gave a certain sense of unifying purpose to the, the fringe movement, the whatever you call it. And then after a while that faded away and it became more fragmented and just started looking in other directions. UFOs, perhaps. <laughs> well, UFOs did make a kind of a big thing in the 1970s, so perhaps mm. there is an element of that in there. But, yeah, and I just become frustrated, not necessarily in people believing silly things, and not even in people believing silly things and believing that that grants them the right to go and try and change other people's minds about stuff. Because, frankly, people are going to do that anyway, regardless of whether we're talking about the truth movement or not. Sure. The things that really, really bother me are the, the everything is fake nihilism of the truth movement and yeah. this neo-Nazi stuff that just seems to be growing and growing. Oh, right. Yeah. In fact, I, I, hadn't, I hadn't noticed very much of that, actually, until I listened to your podcast on it. And then, of course, my ears were open to it. And since then, I've heard it everywhere and seen it everywhere. And I've even had emails come my way on that sort of line, which have been rather unpleasant, some of them. Mm. Sorry, Tom, I said I wouldn't do this. <laughs> I wouldn't take you too far down this line, and I am doing so. So I do apologise for that. It's, it's OK. Um, I don't know. I think it's best for me to not engage with that too strongly, because otherwise I end up getting... I end up spending too much of my energy and getting too angry with these things when yeah. I, I am better off looking at you know, what I do spend most of my time looking at. Yes, OK, well, all right. Uh, well, calm down. <laughs> um, I don't, don't know whether you've got a glass of water there, but have a drink and uh, I will lead you back to what we're supposed to be talking about today, which, of course, is this subject of uh, Edward Snowden, the famous NSA whistleblower, or I don't know, perhaps I should say ostensible NSA whistleblower. I don't know. That depends where the conversation goes. Um, now, I'm going to say immediately that I'm still not quite sure about this. I said to you in my email that I'm pretty much 50-50 as to whether... Edward Snowden is the real deal or not. And mm -hmm. I suppose it's because of that indecision that I've left it as long as I have done before inviting anybody such as your good self to come on and talk about it. Um, but having listened to your shows and interviews and read something of Arthur Silver's posts over at Power of Narrative, I think I've probably come from a, well, this is a vague statement, a 70-30 position, <laughs> closer to mm -hmm. a 50-50. Um, so I'll see if that you can push me further on this during the conversation. Anyway, I know that you are very decided upon this, so I'm going to be asking you to share with us how you see this issue and if you don't mind i want to play devil's advocate um, because i think that's really only fair given that i am still 50 50 about this so as long as you're okay with that yeah, um, yeah but could you just i mean it's been a long time since we actually did have our first conversation so could you very briefly explain a bit about what your websites are 
so that we know where you're coming from? Well, I, um, I mean, I guess I started with, a, like I say, a blog back in 2008, which is now defunct. You can't find it. But I made two documentaries about the 7-7 bombings in London in 2005, one called 7-7 Seeds of Deconstruction. That came out in 2010. And then the following year, I made the sequel 7-7 Crime and Prejudice. Uh, around the same time as the second film, I set up the website investigatingtheterror.com, which essentially is a, I suppose, a research archive and commentary on false flag terrorism and on particularly the spies and other forms of secret agents and assets that exist within these various terror gangs that we get told about and within the individual plots like 9-11 and 7-7, the way that quite a lot of the people who were said to be either the, the suspects, the perpetrators of these attacks, or people who facilitated their movements, they often turn out to be some kind of asset or agent of the security services. And so investigating the terror is essentially my rundown of at least the stuff I've really focused on and dug into in that subject. And then around early 2013, mid-2013, I published my book, Secret Spies and 7-7. And at that point, I was not necessarily done with the topic, but felt like I wanted to take a different direction. There were other things that I wanted to look at. And to be honest, reading grisly post-mortem details and stuff like that, there's only so many years you can spend doing that before you feel like you want to maybe look at another aspect of the intelligence services. Um, And so I noticed this while I was writing the book, essentially, throughout 2011, 12, early 2013. I'd noticed this emerging topic, and I'd got into this emerging topic of state-sponsored culture, state-sponsored entertainment, the Pentagon, CIA, MI6, so on's involvement in films and television. When I was reading this commentary, I thought, firstly, this is a really important topic that seems to have flown under the radar, at least in as much as it being a serious research topic. Lots of people like to allege, oh, that that TV show was just made by the CIA to make you think something. And I'm not saying there aren't these things. I'm just saying as a serious research topic... It's one of those where there's a lot more allegations than there is hard evidence. Mm. So I felt, why not see at least if it's tenable to turn this into something? Is it possible to actually get enough information to talk about this in a serious way? Or will it forever remain the realm of allegation and speculation? And so while I was writing the book, I started researching it. I started gathering what documents I could from archives and so on. And I built the website spyculture.com. And so that is now my main focus, and that's where I host clandestine and do most of my work. Mm-hmm. Um, did, you, did you start putting FOIA requests in as you were developing the website? Was it that early? No, 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 no. It was only after I finished right. the book that I really found the time to start doing things like that. Because the thing with FOIA requests yeah. is you've got to be quite specific in order to actually get anywhere. If you just ask mm-hmm. for you know, documents on the CIA's involvement in Hollywood, they'll just say, that's too broad, we can't find anything, you won't get anything back. So you have to dig into things a bit and start identifying, can I get this? Can I get that? Can I get something on that particular TV show? As it turns out, with the DOD, at least, we now have thousands of pages on their work. And I'm going to be publishing another 1,700 pages soon. Yeah, I I want to ask you about that actually a bit later on, certainly. That's very impressive. Is it right that you studied film at university? Sort of give you this background to what you're doing here. I studied lots of things at university, Uh but yes, one one of them was film and TV history and like film criticism. Yeah. So that was one of the reasons, I suppose, why you were drawn to doing this. Well, as it turns out, I was interested in this stuff long before I had any interest in false flag terrorism. I've always liked spy novels, spy films. I've always been interested in films and cinema in particular, less so with television. Hmm. So I'd always kind of wondered about that question of... Not just how realistic is this, how much is this actually talking about the real world, but also how many of these people are actually in some way connected to or have worked for the security services. That was a question I pondered. I can't remember exactly how young I was when I first started thinking about that, but pretty young, as, as young as a person could be to actually formulate those sorts of questions. So, yeah, it's only in the Internet era that it's actually possible to do the kind of research to start answering that. It's fun for me to do it. It's fun to live in this time and be able to try and actually answer some of it. Oh, you wouldn't have been at all happy in any other age, would you, by the sound of it? (laughs) (laughs) 
I don't know, but I, I can I can certainly say that I'm I'm kind of glad to be born in the age that I was. Yeah. Mm. And so with this kind of uh, the set of interests that you have, you turn a sceptical eye to the whole Edward Snowden story. I suppose to a certain extent that's a bit of a default attitude. I don't know whether that's fair to say. Anyway, certainly the impression I've gained from listening to some of your interviews is that your immediate reaction to the whole Edward Snowden thing was that this is highly dubious. So, mm-hmm. you know, why was that? What was it about the whole thing that made you so suspicious? Well, it's because whistleblowers don't tend to get a lot of media coverage whistleblowers don't tend to really be given the time of day by the mainstream media. And the ones that are, it's a one or two day story. With this, as soon as the story broke, it was picked up by every media outlet imaginable. And they stuck with the story. Mm. And when does the mainstream media ever stick with any story, Mm. let alone one that might actually matter and might actually challenge the status quo in some way? So as someone who tries not to involve myself too much in mainstream media coverage but finds myself watching it anyway that just gave me a reaction of well what's different about this and then it was watching the documentary about him or at least the the short mini documentary that Laura Poitras and Glenn Greenwald made out in Hong Kong was it? Uh Um, Certainly out in China when Snowden was in this hotel in China watching that and watching Snowden himself I found the guy extremely calculated extremely prepared almost for this. Yes, Yes, I see what you mean. Just my instinct started to tell me that there is something up with this. And it wasn't until more information had become available and more documents and more stories and reporting had been made on this that I was wondering, well, the sum total of all of this, and they can talk about however many thousands of pages he supposedly stole from the NSA, but we've only seen at that point a few hundred of them at most. None of it was stuff that I didn't already essentially know or couldn't have already figured out if I'd spent any time thinking about it. And so I was wondering, what's he actually blowing the whistle on here? And is this more about a media campaign than it is about a whistleblower? Well, I think that's a very interesting hypothesis. So the only thing I would throw in there at that point is, you know, couldn't you say that this is really about documents? Whereas previous whistleblowers, you know, Russ Tice, William Binney or whatever, you know, they made these statements, but they didn't have the documents to back it up. So could that explain why the mainstream media was in fact interested with Snowden, whereas they weren't previously with the others? That is the usual counter-argument that people make. My problem with that is, one, the mainstream media usually isn't interested in publishing documents. Even when new stuff comes out at the National Archives, they almost never publish the documents themselves. They're averse to it. It's like some weird tick that they have where they'll happily write a story about this new file from the National Archives and give you quotes from it and describe stuff that is in it. They'll never actually provide you with a link to the National Archives website where you can download it for free. So why is this one different? And that's with something that's 30 years old or 50 years old. It's been released under the 30-year rule, not something that is supposedly controversial that's been stolen from the NSA. And then you have the question of, well, who did he give these documents to? And he gave them to a bunch of journalists who, frankly, didn't have a background in dealing with this sort of material. And you have to wonder, what kind of vetting process did that go through? And yet, did that actually happen? Because like you say, they were publishing these all over the place. Or at least they were publishing you know, pages from them, bits and pieces from them, and writing stories about them. And so it's almost like they had permission in a weird way, to do this, when normally they would not have responded in that way at all. So that's why I don't find that counter-argument convincing, is because, well, even when people have turned up with a whole load of documents, it's usually taken them ages to sift through them, and then they hardly ever publish the documents themselves. And once again, it's usually a short story. It's something they'll publish for a day or two or three, but that'll be about it. Whereas this is one where, completely unabashed, completely without fear... They just published, day after day, documents that had been stolen from one of the world's largest intelligence services. Again, when does the media ever do that, even when they're provided with this stuff? And trust me, I've provided journalists with documents on things that they wouldn't have otherwise read, and they never seem to have the slightest interest in them. So something was different here. There was a different atmosphere. I don't think it was just about the documents themselves, I guess is what I'm saying. Mm. 
Yeah, and, uh, you know, going back to that, I mean, you do mention this business about the smashing up of the hard drives there at The Guardian. I mean, you know, on the face of it, you could say, well, that's some sort of retaliation going on there. But I agree with you that looking back at it now, that does seem to be a quite a ridiculous thing. You know, that the police should think they're getting rid of any information there, because obviously you can just, just copy things. And So more and more I think about it, that was theatre, really. Well, that's how I feel about it. But the only real retaliations as such that we've seen were, like you say, some police and apparently some GCHQ bods turned up at The Guardian and insisted on stripping a few computers down and smashing a few hard drives. Mm. And that was done on video, wasn't it? So you could actually watch it on video. You could watch some bits. Sort of (laughs) chiselling these things. Would they not have taken them back to GCHQ? Because it seems that the authorities don't know what Snowden stole. They've never been certain. There's been lots of different estimates and lots of different claims about this, but the overriding story is they're not 100% sure what was in those documents that he gave to Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras and the rest of them. So why on earth, if they thought those documents were on those hard drives, would they have smashed them up? Well, the, the, like, the only reason I can think of is that they knew there was another copy somewhere, and if there's another copy there, then why, why, why smash them get up rid of the these anyway? Place? Yeah, yeah. What <laughs> yes. are they even achieving? Yeah. The only thing it really serves to do is make it look like, oh, the Guardian are brave, bold journalists who are bucking the system, and they're being victimised because of it. That seems to be the only purpose in that action. That's highly suspicious. I do agree. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you also mentioned uh, this business with David Miranda, didn't you, at Heathrow. For nine hours he was detained, something like that. And uh, he had all this data on USB sticks and a laptop, and I think you somewhere said that you thought that was a bit of theatre as well. Well, I just can't understand, among other reasons, I can't understand why a journalist would give stolen classified documents to his partner, or I, I don't know exactly what the relationship was at that point, so that they can try and smuggle them from country to country? Why do that? I mean, you could send these things via an encrypted email. It's not difficult to get them from one country to another in the internet age, let's face it. Unless I suppose it's 1.7 million documents, (laughs) if we go for that figure. (laughs) Um, Well, that comes with its own problems. But yeah, even Mm, mm. even 1.7 million documents, you could still do it. Could you not, I don't know, hide them in a packets of rice or something? I mean, there's a million and one ways you can get something from point A to point B that doesn't involve giving them to someone who you love, who is now going to take them through a highly secure airport and is obviously going to get arrested because they know who he is. That's the point. He's not some secret person unknown to the security services who's smuggling these things. It's someone that they've got a photo of, and I'm sure they're sat there waiting to say, if that guy comes through, we're stopping him and searching his back. You know, it's interesting, isn't it? Because at the time when this happened, you know, I, was, I tended to be rather carried away with it. And I suppose that goes for lots of things, but it's, it's with the passage of time when you look back at these things, then you, you have a different perspective. And I, I find myself so almost embarrassed, really, that I didn't ask these kinds of questions at the time. Well, but this was one of the things... That again, that struck me about the whole Snowden, or at least the media operation around Snowden, the media coverage around Snowden, rather than the man himself, who kind of hasn't done a huge amount, um, or certainly not since June 2013. He's joined Twitter, hasn't he? Um, (laughs) Again, there's problems with that story. But... um, (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Where was I? Um, Yeah, the, the, the media coverage. It was extremely effective at... Generating consensus, I guess, across broad demographics. You have the common, you know, Guardian reading liberal left. They bought into it, obviously, because this was a very Guardian-centred story, and it's the sort of thing that they like to read about. They don't really want to read about death squads in Syria. They quite like reading about how the government is snooping on their emails. Don't ask me why, but (laughs) those are their media tastes. It would appeal to quite a lot of the alternative media crowd, It certainly appealed quite a lot to your sort of right-wing libertarian types in America. So you have both the liberal left in Europe and the libertarian right in America. They were very much into this kind of story. Well, that explains my interest because I'm sort of I intersect somehow with both of those. Well, uh, (laughs) that doesn't sound like a contradiction in terms, but there we are. That's me. (laughs) Well, not to me. I know it would to some people, but no, no, I I can understand where those two things overlap. Um, And so, as a result, I suppose it's no surprise that you were surrounded by people who would believe this and therefore when you're feeling yeah i think there is this is authentic you're getting a lot of feedback that yes it is a lot of social feedback social reinforcement i mean and being someone who has mild antisocial tendencies when it comes to these sorts of things um that again was something that i just felt i've got to question this at least 
because it's always dangerous. Consensus is a very, very dangerous thing, particularly when it comes to an issue like the security services. Mm. That if lots and lots of people are thinking the same thing, like with 7-7, the story, the overriding story we were given was they failed. Whoops-a-daisy, they lost track of these guys and they went and blew some stuff up. And that is a huge consensus across most of the discussion about 7-7. Yet it's not true, <laughs> or at least I don't think it is, from the evidence I put together in my book and so on. I think there's a very strong case that it isn't. And so I saw that consensus as something that was important to question and ultimately important to attack and try and resist and push back against. And the same thing mm -hmm. with Snowden. It's just as time get, went on, I had more and more questions, more and more doubts and suspicions about what was going on here. And yet the consensus just seemed to be growing. And so sooner or later, I just said, I'm just going to out myself as a, yeah, I think Snowden is basically still an agent of some sort. Yeah, you're very brave in doing that. Not many people who joined you in that. Have you, did you have uh, negative comments come your way because of it? Not as many as I was expecting. Um, hmm. And that proved quite a popular episode as well. So, I mean, a lot of people know that that's my position on this. And yeah, I mean, I got the odd kind of horrible comment or horrible message or something but for the most but no more than usual <laughs> but yeah yeah exactly no more yeah. than i would usually expect so mm. no i know i'm in a kind of minority of a minority when it comes to this topic i know that there are very few people out there perhaps a growing number now who are at least doubting this thing if not going full-blown like me and saying basically i think this guy's cia from start to finish i know that there aren't very many people who think like that and i totally accept that but you know, all I can do is be honest, <laughs> to be fair. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's something worth really taking seriously, obviously, which is why I invited you on, of course. Um, mm -hmm. Your podcast that you produced about this, uh, the main one anyways, is Edward Snowden a false flag? Question mark. So you're, you're making that very, very clear. Obviously, the answer is presumably yes. You would actually go so far as say yes. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, obviously, that's a bit of a tabloid headline yeah. kind of title yeah. but that was deliberate because what's yeah. the point in outing yourself as someone who thinks something like that unless you're actually going to say it quite bluntly and obviously to people that yes this is a position that exists and one that you might want to consider mm. so yeah forgive me for the tabloid choice of title but no, ultimately that's... yes i mean it, it, it's a simplistic way of putting done. it yeah. but yeah my answer to that question is yes mm -hmm. and so what you did in that particular show is that you went through many of the things about his biographical details that made you suspicious and the way that the story had been built up around that. So perhaps it would be helpful if you could talk through a little bit of that. What were the particular things in his life that you found anomalous or just frankly suspicious? Well, if I can add one from the very early part of his life that I didn't cover in the episode because I didn't know about it then because it hadn't been in an interview right. yet. This came out in his first TV interview on American TV with Brian Williams, the now much maligned, shamed Brian Williams, who admitted to lying about the Iraq war, among other things. And in this interview, Snowden says that on 9-11, on the day of 9-11 itself, he was on Fort Meade. I've never told anybody this, uh, no journalist, but I was on Fort Meade on September 11th. I was right outside the NSA. He was, in his words, right outside the NSA. Now, at that point, Snowden was an 18-year-old, unemployed high school dropout. What was he doing on a highly classified military base outside perhaps the biggest intelligence agency in America in the midst of 9-11, the biggest attack on US soil in, you know, however many decades? Doesn't that make you wonder a little bit about who is this guy what what was he doing there i mean this wasn't take your child to work day at the nsa <laughs> they don't do tours for tourists um yeah i i take your point but because that brings up the other question which is what is his parental background i mean were his parents involved with that scene uh his father worked for the coast guard and also on some sort of national security issues which are unspecified, but that somehow involves intelligence, maybe the Coast Guard intelligence, Homeland Security maybe, because Coast Guard is now Homeland Security. Um, right, so maybe it was in fact take your child to uh, <laughs> the NSA day or whatever. <laughs> well, there's no evidence his father worked on Fort Meade or for the NSA, though Snowden did live in Baltimore at this point. He did live pretty nearby. Um, his grandfather worked for the FBI, 